On Five News, the child abuse inquiry left in chaos as a third chair quits. Survivors demand Dame Lowell Goddard explain her reasons for resigning. There must be a bigger reason behind this, uh, why she's uh, resigned, and we've got to find that out. Also this evening... Peace! No justice! No peace! Don't touch me. Oh, no justice. Black rights protesters stage demonstrations across the country, leading to several arrests. RBS posts losses of more than £2 billion. Bad news because we owe most of it. And Get Set for Rio, the build-up to the Games, has been one of the most controversial ever. But finally, it's time for the athletes to make the news. Plus... Wow! Walking for the first time, hope for the little girl named Hope. Welcome to Five News. I'm Danny Sinha. It's the investigation that's supposed to deliver a longer way to justice for so many people. Now survivors of child abuse say they've been let down again after the third chair of the independent inquiry in England and Wales resigned. Dame Lal Goddard's shock announcement comes just two years after the inquiry was set up. To this day, though, not a single piece of evidence has been heard. One survivor's told us he's filled with sadness and needs to know the full truth about why she stepped down. Here's Peter Lane. The first head of this inquiry, Baroness Butler Sloss, quit. Then her replacement, Dame Fiona Wolfe, stepped down too, both over questions about perceived links to the establishment. Now Dame Lowell Goddard has also resigned, little more than a year after she spoke about the scale of the role she'd taken on. The task ahead of us is daunting. The sexual abuse of children over successive generations has left permanent scars. Today, Dame Goddard said taking the job had meant relinquishing my career in New Zealand and leaving behind my beloved family. She cited a legacy of failure around the inquiry and said, with hindsight, it would have been better to have started completely afresh. So where does this leave the survivors of abuse? Decades ago, Reverend Graham Sawyer was abused by a church bishop who was only recently jailed. Graham's still waiting to give his evidence to this inquiry. I'm filled with sadness about this, um, but we've got to pick ourselves up and make sure that someone competent is appointed soon. But she took this on. She knew that it was going to be at least five years. There must be a bigger reason behind this uh, why she's uh, resigned, and we've got to find that out. Dame Goddard's resignation comes amid reports she spent three months overseas, working and on holiday in the first year of her half a million pound job. Her decision to quit will prompt speculation of friction within the inquiry. She's been asked to appear before MPs to give a fuller explanation. She seemed to say that there should have been changes made from the old inquiry that they didn't do. Um, I think the people running the inquiry need to understand that and make changes very quickly. The government says this inquiry into churches, councils, politicians, security services, the army and many more institutions will continue without delay. But campaigners say losing its chairwoman is a huge setback. To me, she was never a good fit, but I do feel the way she's suddenly gone... Uh, <laughs> I, I just feel and worry about the impact that will have had on those who survived. Do they feel let down? How badly do they feel let down? They've certainly been unsettled. Graham never expected this inquiry to be a simple process. After waiting so long to tell his story, he hopes a new chair will be in place soon to keep it on course. Peter Lane, 5 News. Police have arrested a number of protesters who staged a day of coordinated disruption across England. Campaigners for the group Black Lives Matter chained themselves together and lay down on busy motorways close to airports in Manchester, Birmingham and Heathrow. They also blocked tram lines in Nottingham city centre, as Dominic Reynolds now reports. The summer getaway got as far as the Heathrow slip road for many this morning. A few committed people chained together a few miles from the airport. No justice! No peace! Announcing a US movement has landed in Britain. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! 
Protest organisers say holiday makers' disruption today needs to be put into perspective. In comparison to one another, the kind of disruption of racism in your lives, the disruption of the family members and having to kind of live that daily grind, this disruption for a few hours, I mean, it's not much in comparison, is it? At a standstill for the same reason, a road outside Birmingham and the tram lines running through Nottingham. These protests were coordinated and this was the rallying cry. Black people are up to 37 times more likely to be stopped and searched. The online video calling for a shutdown marks the fifth anniversary of the shooting of Mark Duggan, the man whose death in North London sparked the riots of 2011. No justice, no peace. For more than two years, that's been chanted on US streets. No peace! No peace! The Black Lives Matter movement there is a response to the deaths of black people at the hands of white officers. Not everyone stuck on UK tarmac was sympathetic. Somewhat ridiculous, really. Um, they should take the protests to where it should be, in America, not in England. Police removed the Heathrow protesters within a few hours. They arrested 10. There weren't many more than that involved. But this demo was less about attracting numbers, more about grabbing a lot of people's attention. So, Dominic, what do the protesters actually want? Well, that's not quite clear yet, Danny. Obviously, uh, in the US, where this movement started, and the UK, there are lots of important differences, not least the fact that uh, police officers here aren't routinely armed. So. Uh, the leader today of the movement said this is about the everyday disruption that racism, uh, they say, causes in their lives. But if you look at the online material that we got a, a look at there, there are many other things talked about, from uh, mental health to uh, migrants dying in the Mediterranean. So not, not a lot of clarity there about exactly what Black Lives Matter UK will stand for. I'm sure that will develop, but at the moment it's clear uh, that this group just wants to start a conversation. OK, thank you, Dominic. Tens of thousands of passengers on one of Britain's busiest rail services are facing a week of misery after attempts to avert strike action failed. Talks between Southern Railway and union bosses ended in the last hour without agreement. It's all about a bitter dispute about the role of conductors. Union members will walk out for five days starting on Monday. The pilot and co-pilot of a cargo plane have escaped injury after crash landing in Italy. The jet overshot the runway in bad weather at Bergamo Airport and then skidded onto a main road. No one on the ground was injured, though. The wreckage is now being taken away and the airport has since reopened. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn has been criticised for nominating Shami Chakrabarti for a peerage weeks after she led an inquiry into anti-Semitism in the party. Well, Deputy Leader Tom Watson says she does deserve recognition, but the timing of the appointment is a mistake. Now, the Royal Bank of Scotland, the bank that's nearly three quarters owned by us, the taxpayer, has announced losses of more than £2 billion in just six months. It's blamed having to pay out for past misdemeanours. Well, today, speaking to Five News, its chief executive refused to rule out a sell-off of some of its branches. Julian Drucker reports. It was once the world's largest bank, but now it's one of the government's biggest headaches. We now know Royal Bank of Scotland lost £2 billion in the first half of this year. Part taxpayer-owned, RBS keeps on making a loss. Today, its chief executive told me the legacy of the financial crisis is still being felt. We're still dealing with a number of issues from the past and we set out that 2015 and 2016 would be the year where we dealt with as much of the conduct and litigation as we could. Your customers will think they've heard this for years and years though, why is it the same story every time? Well, because some of these issues, you know, date back to 2008 that are now emerging uh, that we need to deal with today. Those issues then. In 2016's first half, RBS lost just over £2 billion. That figure includes £1.3 billion spent on charges for missold payment protection insurance and other so-called conduct costs, which include fines and legal bills. In 2008, RBS was bailed out, taking £45 billion out of the public purse. Since then, the bank has racked up eight years of losses, totalling around £53 billion. The deadline for PPI claims is now being pushed back to 2019. 
that means there still could be more costs added to the, the overall uh, impact on, on RBS. It's not just customers of RBS and NatWest, which it owns, that need the bank to be robust. 73%, that's how much of RBS is owned by the UK taxpayer. The government needs RBS to find its strength as quickly as possible so it can get its money back. But in a changing world, that may be difficult. And what about the future of high street banking? How many branches do you think in the next year will close? Well, I don't know. It really depends on the number of customers that actually choose to use those branches. So it's around customer behaviour, not around us going through and saying we're dictating what, uh, how many we have. Uncertain times ahead, but RBS says it's making progress. So, Julian, what's the chances of taxpayers actually getting their money back from RBS? That's the big question, Danny. How does the government offload all of those RBS shares? At the moment, they are trading so much lower than they were even last year. Several experts have told me the chances of uh, the government getting all of its money back are extremely low. RBS isn't expecting to turn a profit until 2018, uh, so a sell-off isn't likely in the next two years or so. The Bank of England, of course, lowered the interest rate yesterday to 0.25%. Mark Carney telling Sean that there were no excuses for the banks not to pass that on to customers. As of this morning, RBS hadn't done that, uh, but in the last few hours they've said that customers with standard variable rate mortgages uh, will soon benefit. Julian, thank you. Still to come on the programme. After all the controversy, the opening ceremony for the Rio Olympics is just hours away. We'll look at Team GB's chances and hope for the little girl named Hope, the new treatment that's helping this three-year-old walk for the first time. All that and more after the break. Welcome back. You're watching Five News. The unsolved murder of a nurse exactly 40 years ago is a step closer to being cracked thanks to a breakthrough in DNA. Susan Donoghue was beaten to death by an intruder who broke into her flat in Bristol in August 1976. As Warren Nettleford explains, the new technology has already allowed detectives to catch another killer. Blood-stained gloves, a tobacco tin and a truncheon. The main pieces of evidence detectives in Bristol have relied on to solve a murder from 1976. 44-year-old Susan Donoghue worked as a ward sister at a nearby hospital. On an August evening, her partner returned to find her body in bed. 40 years ago, Susan Donoghue was murdered here at her flat in Bristol. Despite an extensive police inquiry, her killer has never been caught. But Avon and Somerset Police now have reason to hope they soon will be. The evidence from the scene 40 years ago has benefited from new technology, which means for the first time, detectives have a full DNA profile of the killer. Every two years we look at the advances in technology, in forensic science, and then we can resubmit and see what else can be done. And by doing that and by never giving up, that's what's led us, particularly this year, to have a huge amount of success. The difference now is the advances in technology and forensic science enable us to join up. So it's like having a hand on one side and a glove on the other and suddenly the two will fit and come together and make it so much easier. Three serious cold cases have been solved by the force this year alone thanks to scientific advances. 17-year-old Melanie Road was murdered in Bath back in 1984. Partial DNA fragments from Christopher Hampton were left at the scene, but they were only matched when his daughter was arrested for a minor offence and gave a DNA sample. He is now serving 22 years for her murder. Limited evidence from many years ago is now becoming crucial today in solving crimes. 40 years ago, we didn't have DNA profiling technologies. We only started using them in the late 80s. And even in the last couple of years, technologies have greatly advanced so that we can now um, profile very, very small amounts of DNA. And also we have a much better chance of getting DNA from poor quality samples. Susan Donoghue would have been 84 this year. Most of her family may have died, but the police remain determined that this latest breakthrough will bring them closer to her murderer. Warren Nettleford, Five News.
Police say thieves tried to break into the mansion of Manchester United star Wayne Rooney as he played a match on Wednesday evening. His wife and three sons were at the game at the time when his house in Presbury in Cheshire was targeted. The suspects have not been caught. And a man has been arrested after being filmed punching a car as he's driven off its bonnet. The man's are also uh, see, said to be seen shouting and waving as the Mercedes edges along a road in Leicester. He was taken into custody before having to be treated in hospital for minor injuries. After what's been a troubled build-up, all attention will now be on the athletes this evening as the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio finally gets underway. The opening ceremony will be watched by tens of thousands of spectators in the main stadium and, of course, hundreds of millions of more people on television right around the world. Well, before that, there's no shortage of spectacular sights. Here's Minnie Stevenson. And so, after one of the most controversial build-ups in history, the opening ceremony is finally upon us, with the Olympic torch arriving at the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio. Issues of security, the Zika virus and a Russian doping scandal have not only given officials headache after headache, but dominated. So now enough of the scandals and on to the sport. As Team GB arrived at their headquarters, the athletes can't wait to get this show on the road. Be so nice to go out there and, and perform well when it matters, running my fastest times and hopefully making everyone proud. It'd be nice personally to, to go back and, and have a medal as as, all the, as a sort of reward for all the hard work we have put in. It's just um, any athlete's dream. It's Olympic champs, you know. It's um, the pinnacle of all track and field athletes' careers. So it's just it will mean you know everyone's dreams will come true if they do well. The athletics won't start until next Friday. It'll be events in the pool and elsewhere that take up the first week. And at the Olympic Village, they've been given some light entertainment to take their minds off training. As for the official entertainment this evening at the Maracanã Stadium, Dame Judi Dench and Pele will be among the star performers at the opening ceremony. Now, it's hard to believe it's been four years since the world's attention and a huge amount of excitement was here at the Olympic Park in London. But for the first time ever, it's the turn of Rio, where tonight it's thought over three billion people around the world will be watching the opening ceremony. Injury meant that British sprinter Marilyn Okoro is missing out on Rio this year. But with the Beijing and London Olympics under her belt, she knows exactly the pressure the athletes are facing. It's immense, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline rushing through you, a lot of anxiety, can I do it? Um, it's been a massive build-up, you know, it's not just this last year they've been doing, you know, things to prepare for this. It's been four years back and, you know, it's, it's the highlight of any athlete's dream. And so tonight, all eyes will be on the opening ceremony. After countless controversies, organisers want this to be the antidote to any negativity so far. And if anyone knows how to throw a party, it's Rio. Minnie Stevenson. Five news. Finally, a little girl whose first steps were more precious than most. Three-year-old Hope Stoker was born with a rare condition that severely affected her physical development and she's never been able to walk. But thanks to a new device and with a little help from her mum, that has all changed. Louise Beale reports. Wow! This is the moment little Hope Stoker first felt what it's like to walk. Strapped to her mum, Michelle, the three-year-old who suffers from a rare condition, took her first steps. It was a moment her parents didn't dare think they'd ever see. Oh, I'm delighted. It gives Hope a chance to experience what our peers are doing. Um, just being upright, being able to go out walking, she'll be able to kick a ball with us. Um, and she loves being upright anyway and being out. She's so sociable. So it'll just give her that experience as well. Hope was born with Odo syndrome. It's affected her physical and mental development and despite being three, she's only just learned how to stand. She never reached her milestones, um, so it's just sleeping's bad, but communication's not there, so it just explains everything. Hope has been able to walk thanks to this simple harness. It should eventually help her to build her muscle strength. It was paid for by a local charity. Michelle um, approached us and said, was there any way we would be able to help and provide this harness to enable Hope to, to walk for the first time? So we were over the moon and all our trustees unanimously agreed we'd love to help. Hiya, Hope. 
As Hope gets used to her new harness, her family say they're positive she'll one day be able to walk on her own. But for now, it's just one step at a time. Louise Beale, 5 News. Brilliant. Lovely story, Laura. Just to tell you what's coming up on 5 News tonight. After today's protests, I'll be finding out more about the Black Lives Matter movement. Why is it needed in the UK and what do its organisers hope to achieve? And I'll be joined by two of our greatest Olympic athletes, Dame Kelly Holmes and Roger Black. And we're going to be discussing Britain's hopes at the Rio Games and also looking back at some of their favourite Games moments. I can't wait for that. Well, that's all from us here at Five News. Next up, Helen has the weather. From all the team, though, thanks very much for watching. Good night.